My guys. Hey, welcome. We got something a little bit different for you guys. Um, this is a new podcast. Um, we're going to dub this one Heart of the City. Uh, we are located in the heart of the city. In fact, we are in City Barbers. Uh, barbershop located right downtown. If you guys haven't been in, come in, check it out. Uh, great shop, but even better barbers. Come in and check it out. This is fun, guys. I've got a couple of guys with me that have been with me basically from day one in the shop. I got Mason Parkin, a.k.a. Ace. Ace, how you doing? Now I'm doing really well, man. Good to be here. And then I got John, Big Papa. John Easton's been with me. I met John in barber school, actually. So John's been with me since I moved back from London. John, good morning. How you good doing? Good morning, Pops. How you doing? Good. All right, guys. Let's get to it. We're going to start this podcast, guys, talking about change, pivoting, growth, and the constant evolution of, like, especially as it pertains to the barber shop, the constant evolution that's needed. You know, we talk, you know, in meetings with you guys, we talk about all the time about how you got to change, how you got to pivot, and different things like that. And, you know, the really interesting thing about this is, you know, our customers usually aren't the ones that are resistant to the change. If we got to change pricing or we got to change service, we saw this during COVID, we had to take their temperature, we had to record their information, they had to wait outside, we couldn't give them coffee. They just kind of went with the flow. But surprisingly, we got a lot of pushback from barbers. And I never really understood that. I, can't, I, I never understood why there's so much resistance to change. Because you got to change. I mean, look at, it, look at it with Apple. How often do you get an update? Hell, you get so many updates now, you now have uh, rapid updates that now that you give authorization to Apple that they just update your phone whenever the fuck they want to update your phone. That's constant change. And we crave that in our technology, and we crave that in our style. We crave that in music. We crave that in entertainment. So why so much resistance? Why do, why do we get so much resistance anytime we, try and, anytime we try and change? John, you've been here day one. This, sh this shop is run. It's, on, it's still on the same foundation of its classic haircuts, its... It, it pays homage to the old school barbershops. We don't have TVs in here. Um, we have a curated playlist. We do classic haircuts. We don't do designs. We don't do all the stuff that everybody else doing. We're not selling tennis shoes. We're not selling weed. We're not selling all the stuff that you see in all the other shops as kind of like this gimmick trend, like jump on. We've stayed very true to that. But this shop changes almost every day daily. It does. So, so what, why is it that we get so much resistance? I think it comes down to comfort. People are just comfortable and they, they like where they are and they're not willing to push that because outside of that boundary is, it's scary. And you have to push yourself outside of that boundary and actually order to grow and hit that next level in your career, in your personal life, in your spirituality, well-being, like comforts where essentially you die. It's the enemy. And I agree. It's one where I think it comes down to the individual's mentality and philosophy. You know, when you have, when you're able to adapt to change, you're, I always see that as a growth mentality mindset. And the individual, if you have that growth mentality mindset, it's okay to keep on changing, to keep growing, to keep evolving. But it's hard. I um, mean, it's daily. It's every hour you're getting new information. That's It's hard. And going to his point to uh, be comfortable you know it's kind of the easy route you know if you stay what you know is good you know it's safe in that zone you don't have to put too much effort into changing or thinking or doing anything new 
Um, and I think the resistance to that is it's harder to have that growth mentality. Um, on the receiving end, going back to our clients, I think it's easier. When you're on that receiving end of change, there's not a lot you can do about it. When you got somebody else telling you, the health department telling you, this is what you're doing, you're kind of just doing it. It's a lot easier to take it, but to lead by example or to initiate that change, I think that's where it really goes into your philosophy and your own individual psychology. Um, and I think that's the hardest part. I mean, resistance is, it's hard. It's hard to change. Well, let me ask both of you guys. Both of you guys have only worked in this shop. You both came directly from barber school to the shop. You've never worked anywhere else as far as your barber career. Why? I understand motivation. I understand all that. Why is it, though, when you guys first come out of school, and I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm talking about new students coming out. They're so easy to work with. They're so easy to get on board. They're so easy. And as soon as they make a certain amount of money, it becomes very difficult. And as an owner, I, I see this. I can see the climb. I call it the hockey stick. You know, you got, you, you got this climb that comes along, and then boom, they just figure it out. But just like the top of a hockey stick, it stops. Mm -hmm. And... Not for everybody. There's a select group. I obviously consider you both in that group. That that growth doesn't stop. It keeps going. But far too many times, once a barber in this industry gets comfortable, gets comfortable with their pay, gets comfortable with their customers, they, they max out. And... From an owner's perspective, it's interesting because there's some clients that, that like that. They like that barber and they'll still sit with them. There's other clients I'll see them pivot and move to another chair because they're craving that growth from their barber. I mean, how, how, many, how many times can you hear about the same sports story? How many times can you, can you the, that client hear the same story about the barber talking about themselves? And for you guys, it's even worse. You guys do nine haircuts a day in here. And if the guy next to you is talking about the same story nine times, by the time you guys are ready to be done for the day, you're like, my God, give it a break. And then you hear it again on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. So, so why is that? Why is it that, and I get that the newness of it is out, because this is an incredible industry. There's really no limit in this industry. You know, when we started back in 2016, John, I remember sitting in barber school with John, and I remember the owner of the barber school talking about if you work hard, you do all the right things, you follow this to a T, you make 60 grand a year being a barber. And I remember thinking to myself, 60 grand? I've spent that on a weekend in Vegas. I spent that on a weekend in LA going to Dodger games. How does anyone pay their bills on 60 grand? And that's where this whole movement started. Like, I'm not gonna use the term six figure barber, but that might be the best way for you guys to illustrate it. That's not my term, somebody else coined that term. But in my shop in particular, if you're not making six figures in 90 days, we got a major problem. We have a major problem. I'm not doing my job as an owner, you're not doing your job as a, bar as a barber, so let's go back. Why, why, why the cap? What, what, goes, what goes through your guys' mind? I mean, I get it. Coming out of barber school, living on top ramen and drinking tap water and learning how to live on 500 bucks a month to all of a sudden going and making five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 a month. You feel like you've arrived, but guys, 10 grand a month, that's the old five grand a month in today's economy with, with how much everything's gone up. Yeah, I mean, it's one where, you know, just taking it from the beginning, you know, it's one where you've never really made even $60,000. You come out of school, you're working hard, you're enjoying what you're doing, you start making, you know, a few grand a week. Um, it's exciting, you know, it's the most money you've ever made. So in your mind, even though for a lot of people, yeah, there's a lot more to go, there's a lot more you can continue to do, it's the most you've ever made. So you're excited, you're feeling good, you're spending more money than you've ever, ever had, you're saving more money than you've ever had, you're buying the new car, hopefully you know, you're investing, you're doing other things with that money, but 
simple answer is the most money you've ever had. So you're enjoying it. But then you get comfortable. You know, your, your bills are paid. Your, you know, your rent's being paid. Your house is being paid. You're eating out if you want to eat out. If you want to buy the new shoes, the new boots, you're buying the new boots. You get the new iPhone whenever you want it. And once you can have your bills and just your kind of experiences in your lifestyles that you want to go out on the evening times with your friends at the weekends of your time, it takes a strong person to push through that. You know, you're good. You feel like it's all set. You're not thinking 10 years in the future. You're not thinking about a family 20 years in the future of what if, man, if I can work hard and build that core and build that foundation now and really invest and really grow with all of that 10 years from now, I'm going to be miles and miles ahead of where I am. Because right now, you know, you've built that comfort zone. You got that buffer around you. You got a couple extra grand in the bank account that you've never had before. It's cushy. You feel good. Nothing. Tire blows out. Great. Buy new tires. Not a big deal. So those type of situations that come up, you're able to achieve them and take care of them. But to push through that and really create a sustainable future and really being investing for the rest of your life, I think it takes, you know, going back to the mentality, it takes a growth mentality or a strong, resilient person that is thinking that far ahead. Um, and again, it's a lot easier to just stay in the right here, right now. You know you're taking care of it. Um, you got you to gotta be able to push through that. I mean, the perks of a human being is we have that choice. Um, Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite sayings out there is we're the only, only thing on this planet that gets to choose where that hockey puck ends, where we actually cap ourselves out. Think about every other thing on this planet. Think about a tree. You know, that tree goes in the soil. Those roots are going as deep and as far out as can possibly go. It's maxing out. It is going to max out until it dies. Uh, same way, going upwards, going as high as possible, as many branches as possible, as many fruits as possible. It goes 100%. It's just no way fans or butts about it. But, you know, when you go to humans, you know, we get that agency. We get to choose. Um, I think that sometimes, choice- though, that, that, that hurts us. Because we get super comfortable. Let me ask you this. How much truth, how much truth, John, do you think there is in this? One of the greatest challenges I have right now in the barbershop is what motivates barbers? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not money. It's, it's not, not money. I think it's, I think it's more so like free time or time away from the shop. But, I mean, to go but, back to the, to go back to like the, the hockey stick mentality i mean it in my mind it comes down to discipline is it is it time off is it a perceived lifestyle because look what one of the things that i have to i just have to accept is the barber schools and the barber industry attracts a certain type of a certain type of personality i get that everybody has a little bit of an artistic but the schools in particular really pushes. You work for yourself. You're your own boss. You dress how you want. You come in when you want. You leave when you want. You do what you want. There's no mention in school, not once, about you work for the client. It's all about you, 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 you. Then these guys graduate. They hit a shop like mine, and it's a buzzsaw. Because these guys have been told for six months or a year, year and a half, you can do whatever the fuck you want. And they get into a shop, and you can't do whatever you want. You have to play. So where, where's the motivation? I don't think it's money. A said he didn't think it's the money. I, I, don't, I think you it's said not. it's not the money. Money is necessary, but where's that motivation? Because maybe that helps me figure out where the pivot is and the change is. I think it boils down to the perceived lifestyle mm-hmm. that guys want to live. And it also add to that is it's kind of lifestyle and balance is what I would say. And everybody's is different. Give me an example. Well, I know for, for him and I, with having a family, with having kids, day-by-day balance means a lot more than week-by-week balance. Being able to – we don't mind working six, seven days if we have to. Shorter but days. being gone all day, not being there for dinner, not being there for our partners, not being there for the family events. I mean, after a few years of doing it, I mean, it's tough. Uh, so having the day-by-day balance in our setting, I know, at least for myself, is it's vastly improved my relationship with my family and my life. And I don't mind working six, seven days if I have to. Well, you do. So, so for those of you guys listen, Ace works six days. He works a little bit shorter days, but he's in the shop six days a week. So he takes one day out. John's in the shop five. Your schedule six. just changed. Yeah, he's six. He's, he's in six. the shop six days, but John likes to start uber early. 
John's like turning the key at six a or seven. Usually it's six. Yeah, six. At six. Yep. yeah, you start at six. We open at seven, and then you kind of do that handoff early afternoon, and then we're obviously open late. And there's other barbers that come in. Um, I do think I, I do think balance is a main ingredient to it. I think there's more to it though, because even when I let barbers choose their own mm-hmm. schedule, which we've been playing with the last two years in here. Even when I let barbers choose their own schedule, it doesn't seem to be enough. So it's not just balance. What, what else is it? Well, I do want to add to that is I think it's almost it's, it's perceived balance is the, maybe the first initial thought. Because on the other side, I think the average person or the, a lot of people, they want week by week balance. And to them, that means, man, if I can work four days or shit, if I can work three days and I have a three or four day weekend, that's great. It's more time to go live my life outside, go do the things I want to do outside of work. Um, but when you're doing that, the days that you are working, all you're doing is working, you know, from sun up, from sundown, you're working. But you that's a trade off. That, that's a trade off that you made. If you want, if you want your balance to be, look, I'm going to work three days. I'm going to work four days mm-hmm. and I'm going to grind. You know, I, I usually don't like guys working more than nine hours because I think their quality, their fatigue, the experience they give their customers, I think it starts to drop off. I don't like seeing guys touch the 10 hour, definitely not the 12 hour mark. So let's say you nine hours, because that's what we work here if you work a full day. You chose that balance. You said, look, I'm going to go three hard in the paint. I'm going to go four hard in the paint so that I can have three days off. But I sometimes wonder if I'm doing guys a disservice by allowing them to do that, you know, it's not for me to say what your balance looks like, but that comes with its own set of problems. Yeah. That's why I think it's not foolproof balance because when you're doing that, you have, you're constantly going up to the peaks. You're constantly coming down to the, to the valleys. You're, you're working nonstop for three days then you're down for four days. You want nothing to do with work on those days off when all you're doing for those three or four days is work, 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 work. Those days off that you have, you don't want to think about it. You don't want to touch your phone. You don't want to answer a phone call. You don't want to answer a client. You want nothing to do with that. So you, when you're coming back to work, now you're exhausted because you, you don't want to be living in that world. You want to be living in the free world. You want to be going doing whatever you want to do. do so you have to pick yourself back up, climb that hill again, go to the peak to work. And then the moment you're, you've got your three-day weekend, you're right back to the valley, not thinking about anything. So there's so much up and down. And do your clients get a better experience from barbers that work more days and shorter days? Yes. Because they're more so. even kill? I yep. agree so, too. Do you I think mean, your clients get a better experience with you working six days, reduced hours on those six days, than somebody that comes in and grinds for two days or four days? Yeah. I would agree. 100%. I would agree. I always use the illustration of uh, taking pictures of haircuts. And if I took a picture of every haircut you did, I shouldn't be able to put them in order that you did. Does that make sense? If you did seven haircuts and I take a picture of all seven haircuts and I put them on a table and mix them up, I should not be able to put them in order. That was the first haircut he did. And I think when guys start to get fatigued, I can put their haircuts in order. He did this one first. He did this one last because the quality of the haircut definitely changes. Guys, it's just like anything else. If I, go to, if I go to Ruth Chris, we've had meetings, we've had family dinners there, we've had business, Christmas parties there. Should it matter if I go to Ruth Chris on a Monday or a Thursday? Should the food taste the same? Yep. Should it matter if I dine at 5 p.m. or 10 p.m. at Ruth Chris? Should the food taste the same? So why is it in barber shops? You get such a different experience and such a different haircut. You know what cracks me up? It, it, and it, it kind of cooled off a little bit during COVID, but it, it seems to be coming back. These guys taking pictures of the dirtiest floor at the end of cutting hair, like this is their badge of honor. You know, that always, that always cracks me up. And it's like, this is how many haircuts we did and different things like that. And I just don't think that, look, if your price is the same if you book in at 7 a.m. versus at 7 p.m., obviously we're trying to accommodate our customers. But I don't think the quality should change based on my barber having a good day, my barber having a bad day, my barber 
being on top of his game, my barber having what you guys often hear me refer to as off-court issues, stuff that has nothing to do with the barbershop or inside the walls of the barbershop, but you bring it inside. All right, so perceived balance. All right, what else, John? What, what, what else is it? Like, I get that there's kind of this lifestyle. I mean, it may not be quite as much, but kind of when we started back in 16, it's tattoos and Harleys and smoking and slick back hair and don't talk to me and I'm my own boss and I can do my own thing. Basically, you look like Johnny Cash or you just got out of Folsom Prison. That was kind of the attraction. It, it's mellowed off a little bit, and I think that COVID had a lot to do with that because I think the guys that didn't have deep books went back to construction. They went and became a tattoo artist. I'm not talking shit on any of those professions, but it, it's kind of that that on again, off again, I'm going to go chase the latest thing. You know, This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to become. Where, where else is that, John? What, what, what else is that? That per, perception of, man, this is why I want to become a barber. We know they want to work their own hours. Well, I also think you just you kind of answered it. It's it's been the hot thing for the past almost decade, where barbering's been hot. It's been attractive. It's sold as quick, easy money when it's not. Well, but, and I told you in 2016 when we opened. I thought we I thought we missed it. Yeah. I was so panicked to get this shop open. I thought we I thought we missed it. I talked about this all the time. I'm like, we gotta get open and we gotta get going because I felt like we were on the downhill. I mean really what happened is we caught lightning in a bottle. We did. We did something but, nobody will ever be able to do again. There, there's no doubt about it. It's just the same people that are leaving the industry or having a tough time. They're just they're chasing that next wave. How easy is barbering? Not. Not if you want to do it well. Cutting hair is the easy part. I've, I always say cutting hair is 5% of what we do. We're in the people business. And that's why we don't hire on talent. I mean, no offense to either one of you. You're both wildly talented. But you look at the latest hires that we've done the last couple of years, it's about personality. It's about all the stuff that we can't teach. It's about all the stuff that we can't send them overseas to learn. It's personality. It's stuff you can't buy. Is it easy? No. What's, what's the greatest challenge you face as a barber? I mean, building, building books and getting client retention is probably... Is it harder to build your books or harder to retain a client? I think those are two different issues. I think retaining is the hardest yeah. part. You know, my answer would have been uh, consistency. You know, I uh, always kind of tell everybody that the, the definition of a, of a professional is consistency. That's you know, it's... You know, showing up, you know, cutting hair. We all know it's not easy. I mean, what, after the first two years, 80% of the industry of new students fall out. I mean, in, good luck making it to five in years. In Utah, in the state of Utah, this, this I know, in the state of Utah, your license, when you first get your license, is good for two years. Only 19% of people that renew their license for the first time renew in the state of Utah. Only 19% of the people, the perception is, are still cutting hair enough to renew their license. And that number, if it was only good for a year, would probably even be a bigger number because most of those guys probably dropped out earlier in the first year, mm -hmm. but you don't have that statistic until you come up for renewal in the second part. It's hard. It's fucking hard. Oh, yeah. You don't get into this because it's easy. But I, th I feel too many times that's what's sold at school. Yeah, I think schools do a great job at marketing to their clients. You know, I, I think it's... They They're a business. After... They're not in business to teach you how to cut hair, guys. No. Any school listening, you know it. I know it. I'm going to call it like I see it. They're in business to get you your digits but they're not in business to teach you how to cut hair, teach you how to be in the per people business, anything like that. It is literally, they're there to help you get a license. But let's face it, that's how they get paid. They get paid based on how many licenses actually convert at the end of the course. You're right, they do a good job. Yeah, they, and they do, they, I think they target kind of that like entrepreneurial, self-employed, 
small business, I think a lot of people have that in them. They want that. They desire that. And, you know, okay, maybe I don't want to go to eight years, 12 years of a university. You know, they got their own opinions about that, the price of it. Everybody's got their own excuse. Hey, you're they, making more money than somebody with not only a four-year degree. You're making more money with guys with dual degrees, master degrees. Hell, I'll put you in a category. You're making more money than some guys with a doctorate. And I think the biggest answer... Why the answer, fuck do I want to go to 12 years yeah. of college? I mean, it's... And uh, rack up all that debt when you can go to school and actually do something that is pretty impactful. I'm not saying doctors aren't impactful, but... I mean, you reap what you sow. I mean, you know, on the other side of that, that obviously not anybody else is going to notice except for us, is, you know, that's seven years of 60 to 80 hours a week. And that's dealing with 40 to 50. And then if you're taking the whole clients that come through... I mean, that's hundreds of people every single day that I'm interacting with, that I'm talking to, that I'm trying to grow with, that I'm trying to give them the best experience, but best communication that they've ever had before, especially in an intimate setting like this. So, I mean, obviously money's fantastic. It lets you achieve more things with your life and where you're going. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's a, uh, you only get that money through the value that you're putting into the marketplace and the value that you're giving your clients in the first place. Um, and I think that's the big thing that a lot of people don't see. I mean, obviously you see the other side of it all, um, which is fine, but it uh, doesn't matter if you're a barber, doesn't matter if you are a small business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a you know, private fund investor, um, you're putting in hours, you're putting in a lot of hard work. And I think that... I, I, I think key. that's the trick point. I think that's where guys get tricked. I, I think they get tricked and they're sold, this is pretty easy, it's quick cash, it's all cash, you know, even though we don't run our, you know, we're cashless here, the guys get, they, they get baited into that, that it's, it's easy. I mean, how many guys that you went to school with that have not worked in the shop? Because we know everyone you went to school with that worked in the shop, I think all but one is cutting. Maybe two, two that aren't cutting. That's a big number. Some of those guys own shops, really successful shops. My boy E, Evan, he knows I love him. He's got a great brand going back east with his wife. You know, how many guys that you went to school with who are still cutting hair? Minus the guys that didn't work in the shop. I know that's hard because you don't keep track of them. Well, I think one, I... To the, one comes to the top of my head. Most of, them, most of them have washed out. Yeah. And I would honestly say that, like, your guys' class and my class, I see more of our class still Pro cutting. Probably than... had more barbers in that early 15 to mid-17, mm -hmm. I think. And I'm not just saying this. Look, I don't cut hair. So I get to look at this from a different perspective. I think that early 15 to that mid-17 era, I don't know what they were pouring in the water at that school. Those are some of the best barbers oh, yeah. on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the most dedicated barbers. And some of those barbers are wildly talented. They just can't get their shit together off court. Two come to mind. There's some of the most talented cutters but terrible barbers. But as far as cutting hair, these guys are absolute fire. They just can't get their shit together outside of the shop. Your customers can't, your customers can't jam with that. So not an easy gig. No. Cool gig. It's a great gig. I think but. it can be the most rewarding gig out there. I always say that the barber industry, I mean, there's a reason why it's been around forever. I mean, we all, went, we all know the history. I mean, arguably the second oldest profession on this planet, on this earth. And it's, uh, I, I think it's one of the most rewarding. I think it is one of the most well-rounded um, industries you could ever possibly have. I mean, you're creating something. Um, the, the things that your brain goes through and your physical body has to go through to create something and to build something. Um, you're constantly communicating. You're constantly taking care of somebody else. You're serving somebody else. Um, you need to improve. You need to grow. You need to adapt. You need to change. If you don't, your client's not going to keep on sitting with you. They're going to go to that next person that's innovating and growing and improving. You know, we all get we all get normalized to where we're at. 
even if you're doing something today that five years ago you couldn't even fathom of doing, you're putting in, you know, 100% more effort, you're doing, you know, 10 more technical things with every single person, with every single idea. After you do that for a couple of months and your guys have experienced that time and time again, it's normal now. You get normalized to it all. So you have to keep building. It's, you know, it's, it's that snowball effect or, you know, the compound effect that we all learned at a younger age. Is it, you have to constantly keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to that toolbox. Um, and I think that going to, you know, going back to change and adapting, um, I, I really think it's, it, it's the growth mentality. Um, you're constantly pivoting. You're constantly adding more information and more tools to your toolbox, but you're you're growing. You're uh, you, and you got to keep on growing, or you're not going to be here five years from now, ten years from now. Your customers, your customers want to see the growth too. This this game has very little when it comes to price. I think that there's too many people that think price controls this industry, and it's not. It's the most successful barbers have good personalities. They have good communication skills. They're, they're people people. They understand we're in the people business. We're, we're not in the barbershop business. We're in the people business. And, you know, I've talked about this before. This is the only place one of the only places you can do face-to-face -face business. Mm -hmm. you know, we talked about this in a meeting. You know, you don't even do face-to-face -face with your banker. You don't do face-to-face -face with your doctor. Half your stuff is web, WebMD and, you know, FaceTime and different things. And they all have their place for it. But if you really think about professions and different things that are done face-to-face, -face, this is truly a unique space to be in because you guys get to be in their space. They trust you. They like you. They know you. They sit in your chair. They share incredible honesty and truth and vulnerability with them and stuff like that. It's a, it, it's an incredible industry to be in. And, you know, I feel very blessed not only to be in the industry, to, but to have met so many people that... I mean, guys, this is no secret. If you, got, if you guys know me at all, you know the shop, you know Ace, you know John. You know, these guys are, these guys are more than friends. These guys are more than family, if you can ever be that. Uh, these two guys right here make it so that the shop is successful. They both know the shop better than I do. Um, you know, I started the shop and kind of had the vision to it, but it didn't take long for guys to figure out. It's these guys in here six days a week. Um, for that, I appreciate it, guys. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very, very grateful. Well, I'm excited about this uh, podcast. We're going to wrap this one up, guys. Um, boy, I can tell already. We're going to get down some pretty deep rabbit holes talking about barbers, talking about clients, talking about theories, talking about business, talking about conspiracy theory i think ace wants to do an episode on conspiracy theory so get ready for that no i'm just kidding that was me that's like hey let's do hats, it baby yeah let's do a conspiracy theory uh, yeah maybe when that comes down so guys what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up hey if you're in salt lake or you're visiting salt lake um stop by the shop even if you don't come in for a haircut just come in and check out this space this is a truly unique space that we created here and we created this space over eight years ago and we really haven't remodeled we we've touched a thing or two changed a shelf here but basically how we laid this out it's it's how it was many years ago and i think our clients like it they like the consistency they like the smell of the shop they like the location and they love the barbers that they come and see so Guys, thanks, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Thank you, Ace. I appreciate you coming in today. Thanks, Sean. I mean, I know you guys are already working, but it does take some time to put it together. I want to thank Casey for those of you guys that uh, listen to me on some of my other platforms. Casey's, you know, our uh, digital engineer in all things. He does recording. He does video. Casey, go ahead and drop a pit, uh, headshot of yourself up here <laughs> at, th at this point in the, in the credits. But... Uh, yeah, guys, we got more stuff coming to you. So uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget to share this episode with somebody you think might enjoy it. And we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hey, thanks, boss.